Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's lesson on elections in the United States. Uh, this is an election year, and it's important that you as students understand how the election process works and what's going on as the year goes by as we build up to November's general election. And the first thing we are going to discuss is the types of elections that we have in the United States. And when we're talking about elections, we are talking about federal elections. In other words, elections for the government in Washington, D.C. We have state elections, we have local elections, but for the purpose of this lesson, we are talking about elections that occur for the United States government. And so the first thing we need to talk about is that there are two types of elections. There are primary elections and there are general elections. The primary elections come first and they occur earlier in the year. Uh, a primary election occurs usually sometime between January and June. Sometimes they can occur as late as September. Um, but they need to occur at least a couple months before November because November is the general election. And the purpose of a primary election is to choose candidates for the political party. So um, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are our two large parties, but even the smaller parties use the primary process to choose their candidates because in the general election, you can only have one candidate from each party run against each other. So you have to decide who that candidate is going to be before the general election. Voters also have to choose the party that they want to vote for, and they also get to choose between the candidates who want to run for that party. So in this case, we've had a very large number of Republican candidates running for president in 2016 and as of this recording it has been narrowed down to Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, and John Kasich. Uh, the Democrats had fewer candidates um, so it's been mostly Hillary Clinton competing against Bernie Sanders and by the end of the primaries um, those are going to be narrowed down to one candidate each. The same occurs with Senate races and the same occurs with races for the House of Representatives. Once the primaries are over, we then have a general election. And a general election always occurs on the first Tuesday in November of even-numbered years. In fact, that's in the Constitution. So the election dates are set in the Constitution. Uh, there are some countries that don't have set election days. Uh, they have elections under different circumstances. But in our system, we always know when the election is going to be well ahead of time. And from the perspective of other countries, our election season goes on forever. Um, all registered voters get to choose between the candidates of all parties in the general election. So in the general election, everybody who's registered to vote gets to vote, and they get to choose between candidates of all the parties. Um, whereas in the primaries, you're limited to voting for candidates of one party. You have to choose which party that is, or if you're not affiliated with a party in most states, you can't vote for anybody because you're not affiliated with the party. So there are three federal offices that we have elections for. The first federal office we have election for is the Senate, and that's the easiest one to describe, so I'm going to do that one first. Senate elections basically elect all 100 senators in the United States Senate. And the senators serve for six-year terms. So once they're elected, they don't have to run again for six years. One-third of the senators are up for election every two years. So we do not elect the entire Senate every two years. The Senate is broken into thirds. Um, and each of those thirds is called a class. So there's class one, class two, and class three, and they rotate through their election cycles uh, every two years until you get to the, the six-year number, and then they start over again. So there are three classes. 
And senators are elected statewide. So if you are elected as a senator, you are elected by all of the voters of your state. So those are some important distinctions to know about senators. Uh, it's also important to know and understand that you have to be 30 years old in order to run to be a senator, which when the Constitution was written was considered old. These days that's not considered old. House elections are different. When we talk about the House, we're talking about the House of Representatives. Members of the House have to run every two years. So they are pretty much always raising money and trying to run for re-election because they have to face the voters every single time there's a federal election. And they are elected from districts within their state. So they are not elected by the entire state. They are elected by um, smaller portions of their states that have roughly equal populations. And there are only five states that elect their representative statewide, and that's because they only have one representative, and that would be Alaska, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming. Uh, all the rest of the states are divided into districts, and so depending on which part of the state you live in, you're voting for a different member of Congress. There are 435 members of the House of Representatives, and you only have to be 25 years old to run for the House. And then the elections that most people pay attention to, the presidential election, occurs every four years. And the president is elected by something called the Electoral College. And obviously every single state gets to vote for president. And president and vice president are the only two offices that are elected nationwide. But the Electoral College is its own special animal, and we're going to talk about that on a separate slide. So the next question we're going to ask ourselves is, what is a primary election? Um, I basically told you, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail here. Um, so bear with me. In a primary election, members of the same party run against each other. And the mission is to decide who's going to represent that party in the general election. So you can only have one. And the primary process is designed to be a fair way to get down to one candidate. Primaries can be closed, which means that you actually have to register as a member of a political party in order to vote in that primary. That's one way the parties uh, keep control over their election process. There are also states in which primaries can be open, which means when you go to vote or when you decide to vote, you don't choose your party until the time you vote. So you can literally treat it like a buffet menu, and each time there's an election, you could decide which party you wanted to vote in based on which election was more competitive or how you were feeling at that particular point in time. Um, open primaries are a little bit more of a dodgy proposition for the parties because you're allowing outsiders essentially to come into your process and decide your candidates. But some states make that decision and some parties allow the states to make that decision because this is not a decision of the government, this is a decision of the political parties themselves. And then there are caucuses, and you probably hear this word, it's a funky sounding word. In a caucus, vo voters actually go to a place and they're asked to join groups based on which candidate they support. So you have to publicly support your candidate. It is not a secret ballot. And then these groups basically kind of debate with each other until they narrow down to the point where one candidate wins the caucus for that precinct. So a precinct is a narrow geographic area, um, like say Waldo um, was the meeting place for its precinct all the people in the local neighborhood would meet there, vote, and then Waldo would report out its precinct results. Oregon doesn't have caucuses, so that's not something that would happen here, but Washington State does have caucuses. So the caucus is an older method, and it's uh, done in the towns, counties, and districts. It's not a statewide deal. So the primary is more common, and primaries usually see a lot more voters turn out um, which is why there are those who argue that caucuses are less democratic. 
So let's talk about the House of Representatives. Uh, when I talk about the House of Representatives, there are 435 members, and they have to run for election every two years. But they run in districts, and that's where things get pretty interesting. You're going to be noticing those pictures on the right. I'll explain those in a minute. First thing you have to do if you're running for the House, you have to win your primary, which is usually pretty easy unless it's an open seat where the person who's been the member of Congress isn't running again. Um, and then they have to run in every decennial general election. Decennial is a vocabulary word, and it means every two years. So you're always running for re-election, so you have to stay popular from a certain point of view. They run in districts, and districts are portions of a state. So the shape and population of those districts really is the interesting factor because depending on how those districts are drawn can have a real big influence on who actually wins the election um, and that upper left hand picture is a perfect example those districts can be manipulated in a way that gives an advantage in the election to one party or another and that process is called gerrymandering so what you see on the left is the state of Michigan um, as it was in the decade before this one. So from 2001 to 2011, the state of Michigan used the districts you see on the left, and you'll notice that they're mostly blue. And the reason that they're mostly blue is they were drawn by Democrats in order to um, create as many possibilities for Democrats to win as possible. Well, later in that decade, the Republicans took over control of Michigan's legislature and Michigan's, Michigan's governorship. And so when they had a chance to redraw the lines after the census, they drew the lines you see on the right. And lo and behold, as if by magic, you see that lots more Republicans got elected in Michigan. And then if you look over here, this is a district in Chicago that is specifically designed to elect a Latino member of Congress in Chicago. His name is Luis Gutierrez, and he always wins because this district is drawn specifically to make his winning a foregone conclusion. And then in Texas, between 2002 and 2004, the Republicans took over control of the state legislature. So you have three districts here, but they were redrawn um, in this case, they both elected Democrats, but when they were redrawn for the 2004 election, they were drawn in a way that was designed to elect Republicans rather than Democrats. So these three pictures are an example of what we call gerrymandering. And there are some states that take that process out of the hands of politicians and put it into the hands of independent people and in those states, the districts tend to be a little bit more normal looking and they are more designed to represent the communities where the people are elected from than represent the parties to guarantee the parties that they can get as many members as they possibly can out of an election. So let's talk about the presidency. There are two parts to the presidential election process. The first part of that process is called nominations. And in order to be nominated, that means you are being chosen by your party to be the candidate for president in that year. Each party and state has its own process for choosing people called delegates. Delegates are live people who go to a convention in the summer and vote for who they want the candidate to be for that party. There are two ways to choose delegates. One of them is called a primary, and another one is called a caucus. And I talked about that a little bit earlier. Delegates are chosen in all of the states. So all 50 states, even territories like Guam and the Marianas Islands, uh, get to vote and choose delegates. And they go to a convention in the summer, a convention is a gathering of people elected to represent the party from across the country. And at the convention, they vote and they choose the candidate 
for president and the candidate for vice president. So both of those things have to happen at a convention. It's the convention which makes that choice official, and that person is then officially called the nominee. If no candidate wins a majority of delegates in the primaries, which might happen this year, especially on the Republican side, then the convention chooses the nominee, and they often have to have more than one ballot to do that. So, for example, if no one gets a majority, more than 50%, on the first ballot, then it's open season. Uh, the first time, the delegates have to vote the way their states voted, and after that, on any further ballot, each delegate is free to vote however they want to vote when it comes time to choose their candidate. So you'll notice here that there were 2,472 uh, Republican delegates, and it takes 1,236 in order to get a majority. So if a candidate in all 50 primaries and caucuses doesn't manage to get more than 1,236 delegates, then you have the distinct possibility of an open convention where the delegates choose the candidate rather than the voters because the voters have not issued what you would call a majority verdict. And in the Democratic case, this is the uh, Clinton versus Sanders um, race um, as of April 13th, 2016. So all the states you see in white have yet to vote. And um, Hillary Clinton is leading, but it is not yet completely decided as of this day. So, a brokered convention is a convention where no candidate has a majority of the delegates, and it is possible that power brokers can come in and kind of push things around and maybe get the candidate of their choice nominated. This really hasn't happened since 1976, and if it happens in the year 2016, it is going to be fun to watch. So pull up a chair and stay tuned, kids. You may even want some popcorn for that. The next thing we have is the general election. And the general election occurs the first Tuesday in November. In a general election, you're choosing the president, the vice president, one third of the senators, so 33 or 34 out of 100 senators, and all of the members of the House of Representatives. So in this case, this is the presidential election. Uh, from 2012. This is the Senate election from 2012, and this is the House of Representatives election from 2012. By the way, states where you see a lighter color, it's lighter because that was a party switch in those seats. States where you see a lighter color over here are lighter because it, there was a party switch in those seats. So the president is elected through a process called the Electoral College, and that I'm going to describe to you on the next slide. Hi, Charlie. Uh, senators are elected by a plurality vote in their state. So plurality just means whoever gets the most votes. That does not mean they have to get more than 50%. So if you have three candidates running against each other, one of them gets 37%, one of them gets 35% and the other one gets 33%, the person with 37% would win that election. That's called a plurality. And many races are won based on a plurality. Uh, members of the House are elected, again, by a plurality, but only within their districts. So this map over here is actually broken down into specific districts, which is why the colors don't match the shapes of the states. Basically, what you see in blue there are seats that, like these lighter blue ones, are seats that were Republican and switched to Democrat that year. Remember, this is 2012, so this does not represent the Congress we're living in now. It represented the Congress before the one we're living in now. So let's talk about the Electoral College. This is the thing that most Americans don't understand particularly well, and I'm here to explain it to you right now. So these three graphics hopefully will help to make it clear for you. First thing you need to know is that every state is given electors for president. So
So that number is equal to however many members of the House and Senate that state has. So for example, we're in Oregon. Oregon has five members of the House of Representatives and it has two senators. That gives us seven electoral votes. Our neighbor to the south, more people than any other state, has 53 members of the House of Representatives and two senators, and therefore it gets 55 electoral votes, by far larger than any other state. Uh, Texas comes in second at 34, Florida comes in third at 27. New York used to be bigger than that, but New York is now down to 31, which I guess is slightly larger than Florida. Yeah, Charlie's very fascinated by that. So, the electors were people who would then vote for president. So when you are voting for president, you are not actually voting for president. You are voting for people who promise that they will vote for your candidate for president. You're not voting for the president themselves. So, all of the electors from a state vote for the candidate the people of that state voted for. So it's a winner-take-all system. So whoever wins a state gets all of the electors from that state, which is why you see these states color-coded. The states in blue uh, voted for Barack Obama in the 2012 election, and the states in red voted for Mitt Romney. So all the states in blue added up to 332 electoral votes, and all the states in red added up to 206, and the magic number is 270, so Barack Obama won the election with 332 electoral votes. We're going to talk about that map on the right in a second. Uh, whoever gets the most electoral votes for president wins. Uh, since there are 538 total electors, it's, 500, it's the number of members of Congress plus three because Washington, D.C. is given three electoral votes. So right now the magic number is 270. If we ever get another state, that will change. So the map on the right is there because this is something that we lived through in the year 2000, which is before most of you were born. Um, it is possible for a candidate to win more votes across the country and yet lose in the electoral college. And that's what happened in the year 2000. In the year 2000, the person who won the election actually lost what we call the popular vote. He got 600,000 fewer votes than the other candidates. And that, my friends, is a good time to pause this recording and take a break, and I will explain that to you in more detail. I'm now on Google Classroom, and I am going to explain this to you in more detail. So we're going to go to Dave Leap's Atlas of Presidential Elections, one of my favorite ele elections, atlas.org. And we're going to go up here to election results. Now, election results is a great place to go. It allows you to choose between all of the states. So we're going to choose the 2012 election because that's the most recent one. And here you see the results to that. In 2012, Barack Obama and Joe Biden got 65,918,507 votes, or 51.01%. And Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan, the Republicans, got 60,934,407 votes, or slightly more than 47%. It's a difference of about 5 million votes, or 4 percentage points. So it's a, it's a clear victory. It's not an overwhelming victory, but it was a solid victory for President Obama as he was running for re-election. Um, however, in the Electoral College, which is the only thing that matters, the president got 332 electoral votes, to Mitt Romney's 206. So 51% of the popular vote became 61.7% of the electoral vote. And 47% of the popular vote for Mitt Romney shrank to 38.3%. If you break it down by state, it looked remarkably like this. And Nebraska and Maine, you notice they look a little bit different because they actually give away their electoral votes by congressional district. Uh, if every state did that, things might get a little bit different, but every state does not do that. And if we broke it down by county, you would think that Mitt Romney won in a landslide, 
uh, but he didn't. It just happens to be that the rural counties, the counties where not very many people live, happen to be a lot more conservative and Republican. So let's go ahead and take a look at another election. And that's the year 2000. Uh, this is definitely the most controversial election of my lifetime, the 2000 presidential election. And I want you to notice the difference between this and this. Okay. Uh, George W. Bush was elected president. He had 50,462,412 popular votes, or 47.87%. However... The losing candidate, Albert Gore and Joe Lieberman, got 51,009,810 votes, or 48.38%. So it's about half a percentage point more of the vote that um, President, excuse me, wanted to be President Al Gore and Joe Lieberman got. But because we elect the president through the Electoral College, George W. Bush actually got five more electoral votes than Al Gore. And the natural question to ask yourself there would be, why? So let's look at the map. Even more blue than 2012 because the Republican did win. These were the electoral votes in that election. And the one we need to really focus on is right down here in Florida, where we can go to those exact election results. And in Florida, you will notice that the difference in the vote was less than 600 votes. This went on for weeks, kids. Um, they kept counting and recounting the votes, and it actually went to the Supreme Court of the United States before the Supreme Court stopped the recounts and had this be the official number of the result. Just based on that 0.01, that 1 one hundredth of a percentage point, uh, George W. Bush won all 25 of Florida's electoral votes because, remember, it is a winner-take-all system. So these 600 votes were far more important than the 600,000 votes that you see at the top right here. Now, this has happened two other times in history. One of those two other times was way back in 1888 when President Grover Cleveland actually won the popular vote but lost the electoral vote to Benjamin Harrison. And what you will notice really shows the geographic divisions in the country at the time. And then there was 1876, which is even more clear cut. In 1876, a gentleman by the name of Samuel Tilden got way more votes than Rutherford Hayes, but Rutherford Hayes ended up getting the electoral votes needed to be elected president. Things looked way different back then. So, two other examples in history. Another thing we can do is kind of play around with what might happen in this year's presidential election. This is a website called 270 to Win, and it's pretty interesting. Um, basically, what you see right here is the country as it stands right now, and this is based on polling when people get called at their houses to ask how they might vote. And this really, really kind of shows the dynamic in the country. Um, the states you see in blue are basically all but guaranteed to vote Democratic in this year's election, including Oregon, and the states you see in red are all but guaranteed to vote Republican. So this map is assuming that the Democrat is going to win at least 217 electoral votes and that the Republican is going to win at least 191. So that's what we call the low water mark. So if the Republicans want to gain the presidency, they have to win more of these states that you see in gray than the Democrats do. So let's start with the 2012 election. I'm going to go ahead and set things up to the way they finished out in 2012 when President Obama was re-elected. And yes, I do have this memorized. I'm nerdy like that. Charlie's pretty amazed by that. 
The only one of these states that Mitt Romney carried was North Carolina. The rest of them were carried by President Obama. So right here, we're starting with 332 to 206. So if a Republican wants to win the White House, they need to get that red number over 270. So how are they going to do that? The first thing they need to do is focus on the states that have the most electoral votes that can possibly be flipped. So the first one of those is Florida. So let's go ahead and shift Florida. If we shift Florida's 29 electoral votes, it has more votes than it used to because of population changes, it's now gone to 303 to 235. Another state that Republicans have to win because no Republican has ever won the presidency without Ohio is Ohio. Let's shift its 18 electoral votes. Now the Republicans up to 253, the Democrats down to 285. Now we're in the ballpark of a possible Republican victory. Another possible victory um, for the Republicans could be in the state of Virginia. That's a possibility because Virginia, up until Barack Obama, voted Republican. The last two elections, it's voted Democrat. So let's go ahead and flip Virginia. Now the Republicans are only four electoral votes away. So what would the other two likely states be? My personal guess would be either Colorado or Iowa. And if I had to guess between the two, I would say that Iowa might be more likely to vote Republican. So let's shift Iowa. And now the Republican candidate, whether it's Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, or John Kasich has won the presidency and the Democratic candidate, whether it's Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton, has lost the presidency. So when you hear people say that Democrats have a better chance than Republicans this year, part of their reasoning is that the Republicans have a much steeper hill to climb because they have to flip all of these states to the other side, or at least some of them. So unless there's a major shift in public opinion, that's a fairly challenging hill to climb. Let's return to our PowerPoint. Back to where we were. So we've already done this slide here. So I'm going to go ahead and flip through all that. You've seen all this before. We're going to the next slide. So the question is, is the Electoral College a fair system for electing the president? There's a lot of controversy over this, especially considering the 2000 election. So those people who say the Electoral College should be replaced and we should simply create a system where all the votes across the country are counted and whoever wins the most votes becomes president, it might not be as exciting on election night because you won't see the map change colors, but you will maybe get a result where um, it's a little bit easier to understand. So people who argue the Electoral College should be eliminated believe that every vote should count equally everywhere in the country. A vote in Oregon should be exactly the same as a vote in Florida, should be exactly the same as a vote in North Dakota. Um, that's a fairly strong argument from this political science graduate um, writing this video for you. Actually, I'm not writing the video, I'm talking to you. Um, there's also the argument that losers should not win. In the case of 1876, 1888, and 2000, um, we had a president elected who got fewer votes than the person they lost to nationwide. And then there's the argument that candidates should campaign everywhere in the country, and under the system that we have, candidates pretty much only campaign in the states that have a chance from flipping from red to blue or blue to red. We call them swing states. All the other states hardly ever get a visit from the presidential candidates. And that's what I just said. Candidates only go to swing states. So if a state's not on the borderline between voting for one candidate or another, it generally doesn't get visits from presidential candidates. However, those people who think we should keep the Electoral College think that um, the candidates would only go to big cities where all the voters are if the Electoral College was eliminated. They would just go to Los Angeles and New York and Houston and Miami, and they would never visit any place other than big cities because that's where most people live. And so people out in the country 
would never see a presidential candidate because the Electoral College forces them to go to certain places within certain states to win those electoral votes. The other argument is that under the Electoral College, small states actually have more power and they actually matter, whereas if we got rid of the Electoral College and elected the president based on popular vote, places with small populations would basically get ignored. So if you were a small state that didn't have a major city, you might never see a presidential candidate. Then the other argument is that it's history. This is the system we've had since the Constitution was ratified in 1787. This is the system we should keep. Um, the times where we've had a loser win have not been very often and it's part of the tradition of our country. So you can make your own decision about that. It sounds like it might be an absolutely brilliant basis for a Socratic seminar. Should the Electoral College be replaced? I've even provided you with some arguments. Look at that. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes my lesson on elections in the United States. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, as you can tell, this is a subject I enjoy and appreciate. And I hope after listening to this that perhaps you enjoy and appreciate it as well. Um, if you have any questions, the video is now going to end and you will be able to ask me or whatever teacher is showing you this video uh, to explain anything you may not understand. This is Mr. Blumendahl signing off from yet another installment of the Waldo Social Studies channel.